everyone. Welcome to our Big Tent book party in January 6th update. It's a book party because we're going to hear from our old friend Norm Eisen about his latest book, Trumpery, How to Restore Ethics, the Rule of Law, and Democracy. And it's a January 6th update because our new friend, Joyce Vance, is going to talk Trumpery with Norm. And then the two of them will give their thoughts on what we'll learn from the January 6th committee hearings and implications for the participants in the insurrection. As most of you know, Norm's a former Obama ethics czar and ambassador to the Czech Republic and co-founder and co-chair of the Board of States United Democracy Center, as well as a prolific author. We're excited, Norm, to hear about Trump Ray. Joyce White Vance, new to Big Ten, but familiar to many of us, is a distinguished law professor at the University of Alabama School of Law, hence our song when everybody joined, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and a legal analyst for NBC and MSNBC. She's also a co-host of two podcasts, Sisters in Law and Cafe's Insider with Preet Bharara. Joyce, we're thrilled to welcome you to Big Ten. I'm so glad to be with y'all. Yes, that's so great. Joyce and Norm will talk for about half an hour and then Wendy Rogovin will moderate a Q&A. Please put your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Quick announcement before we get started. Next Tuesday, May 24th at noon, we'll have letter writing to Michigan voters. Thanks Joyce and Norm, looking forward to the conversation. So Norm, I'm going to dive right in because we only have about 30 minutes and I have so many questions for you. Is that fair? Yes. Let the MSNBC CNN Legal Commentator Summit begin. <laughs> well, here we go. I'm going to start at the very beginning. Y'all, let me just say that this is a fascinating and a compelling book. And I usually skip over the early bits, but literally the first substantive page of this book grabbed me. And, and Norm, here you have actually definitions pulled from history of the word trumpery, which I'm not sure I fully appreciated was an actual word. I want to share a little bit of, of what you included uh, with our participants tonight. Trumpery, noun, pronunciation, trumpery. Definition one, deceit, fraud, imposture, trickery. Uh, from 1899, you have a definition that says, they concord it all together in trumpery and false it. Sort of conveys the precise idea, <laughs> right? 1677, their ethics were but false or imperfect ideas of virtues. Their politics were but carnal and so false reasons of state and therefore stilled in the scripture, trumpery, deceit, and lies. And I guess history actually holds up in some cases, maybe not so well in Justice Alito's draft row opinion, but here it's pretty good. Um, it's interesting to me that you started with these historical definitions. Talk with us a little bit about trumpery, which isn't just the title of the book, but this entire concept that animates your vision of where the country needs to go. Thank you, Joyce. And, uh, and, and, um, uh, before doing that, I'll just say a word of welcome. There are people on this call, Big Ten, my, my umpteenth appearance, and my first book party at the Big Ten from every different part of my life. I see high school friends who are on here, and college and law school, Obama campaign, and White House companions from my ambassadorial days. Brookings, States United, and everything in between. And I especially want to thank my dear friend, Sue Mandel, the wonderful Vanessa Thomas, Wendy Rigovin, whose brother is a friend from many of those episodes of my, uh, of my career and existence, and all of you who are old attendees under the Big Tent or you're here for the first time, I have to warn you, once you've hung out under the big tent, you'll never leave. So I'm glad so many people from my families are able to join my big tent family. So in terms of, uh, of your question, Joyce, about trumpery, first I have to say that I wish I were clever enough that I had thought of calling it uh, overcoming trumpery and using the term trumpery. I had Trumpism in the title, 
And I asked my brilliant English professor wife, Lindsay, uh, you know, is there a better? She said, what about trumpery? And so it just puts a smile on my face. And you have to use humor to deal with, uh, with this situation that the book describes. And as you say, it's an ongoing problem. Trump may be out of the White House, although we know he's going to run again. But trumpery uh, is running amok. And what we mean by trumpery is my co-authors and I analyzed almost 400 pages in length, um, analyzed uh, Trump's administration. We asked ourselves the question, if we really studied what happened in every different aspect of those four years, foreign and domestic, it was there, was it really as chaotic and ad hoc and random as it often seemed? Or was there a method to the madness? And what we discovered was when you analyze the data, that there were actually seven deadly sins, that there was a pattern that in his own reptilian way, he's no great philosopher, but his uh, uh, reptilian brain led the evolution of a seven aspect repeated strategy of corrupt governance. We call it in the book, the seven deadly sins of trumpery. And it, it started, starts with his disdain for ethics. It rolls, rolls through the 30,000 lies, uh, the assault on the rule of law, uh, and it culminates in the attack on democracy itself. It's an American-flavored form, poisonously-flavored form of autocracy. And uh, it is, uh, he may be out of the White House, he's going to try again, but the acolytes of Trump rejoice, as you know, you cover them, you write about them on your podcast, on TV, and your columns for NBC, think. Trumpery is everywhere. It's on the ballot uh, in Pennsylvania in the form of Dr. Oz. Um, Liz Cheney just called out the trumpery, the rottenness in her own party, refusing to, to, to uh, expose the, the replacement theory and the white supremacy to say a word about it uh, that led to the terrible events, horror in Buffalo. Um, it, Jim Jordan may be the next chair of this the House Judiciary Committee. He's an acolyte of Trumpery in the House. Kevin uh, McCarthy's an enabler. Um, it's in the Senate in the form of the Josh Hawley's and the Ted Cruz's. Dr. Oz is running for the Senate on the Trumpery ticket, Herschel Walker, and on and on across the country. Hundreds and hundreds of gubernatorial election denying Secretary of State and AG candidates will be in charge of administering elections. So we have to sound the alarm and we have to describe the solutions. I know we're gonna talk about those today. The book is rich in solutions and we can win. We can defeat Trumpery 2020 was a great national referendum on democracy or Trumpery. Democracy or this American form of autocracy. The country rejected it. We can win again in 2022, 2024 and beyond. And the book talks about how. So this is sort of nightmare stuff. And I think literally for many of us, it is nightmare stuff, thinking about a return of Trumpism. Your book is a great antidote for that. And for folks who haven't had a chance to look at it yet, I teach a seminar in the spring called Democratic Institutions. So perhaps this book spoke to me very strongly because I have that academic interest. But there's a really fascinating format. It's a series of writings. They feel very intimate to me. They feel like essays in a way, but really it's chapters of a book. And each section combines the story of what the Trump administration did to violate our norms, to violate our institutions in a specific area. There's a layout of both the legal facts that you need to understand that area, um, sort of a policy analysis, and then, as Norm says, perhaps most importantly, this idea of what are the solutions? Because I think that we all know, in a sense, what the problems writ large look like. 
the critical piece as we move forward is what are the solutions? What are we going to do about it? So Norm, can you talk a little bit, um, maybe start by identifying each of the seven deadly sins of trumpery and explaining to us what they are. I think the layout is a little bit unusual and not quite the way most people would categorize them. Yeah, we were surprised when we studied the data and the stories. And Joyce, you know, you and I are trial lawyers. Uh, that's kind of why we became such fast friends when the two of us started, were asked to analyze. In fact, you know, although Joyce now has two podcasts of her own, Joyce and I cut actually uh, a podcast we did a pilot of a podcast together with asha rangava and i just i was the host of that podcast and i did not have the patience to ever do a second one you were wonderful on that joyce but i didn't I have the patience so much that that didn't get off the ground just to I, get to talk I with you and didn't. asha was a treat it was fun imagine the three of us the msnbc cnn summit once a week in a podcast but i just didn't have the patience to host anyhow you've outdone me you have two now so we got to be friends joyce and i as trial lawyers who were asked to comment on this extremely dangerous abnormality that we have now analyzed with the seven deadly sins that constitute trumpery. And as trial lawyers, we know, it puts a smile on my face when Joyce says there's stories, narratives, because I work so hard with my contributors to get them tell stories. We need to capture the story of trumpery while it's fresh in our minds, that first year after we wrote it, the first year after Trump left. Um, and then to, to have the solutions uh, in there as well, and the data. and as you say, the seven deadly sins of trumpery, this is what emerged when we studied the data. These hundreds and hundreds of pages of, um, you know, one person talking about Trump's attack on DOJ and the rule of law, another person talking about ethics, another person talking about the international damage he did. What emerges? So the first is, I know for me, and I have Walt Chow, who's the author of this ethics chapter, one of, one of the country's great ethicist. I, Trump lost me when he had that press conference, his first press conference as a president-elect, and he says, a president cannot have a conflict of interest. That's a lie, by the way. Uh, and I can take all the money I want through my hotels, foreign government payments. That is the only ethics rule that is so important. It's in the Constitution. Of course, all of you know I've talked about it on the Big Ten before. Emoluments right? It's the most important ethics rule of all, the most important conflict for a president. I actually was at one point consulting with the Trump transition as patriotic American. He wasn't my candidate, but I wanted to help them on these ethics issues. That's when he lost me. That's sin number one. And we saw that from the beginning to the end. It's a great example of sin number two, assault on the rule of law. But we saw it, saw it so often, like that first unconstitutional Muslim ban, that even the um, uh, majority Republican Supreme Court wasn't prepared to entertain. Unfortunately, they let him fix it, told him how to fix it. Second Muslim ban, assault on the rule of law, another characteristic of Trumpery, the lying. Look at the, 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 those two examples I gave you were then followed by 28,000 998 plus other examples, over 30,000 lies that the president told, ex-president told in office. And the sheer shamelessness. Look at how the day after he fired Comey, he had, oh, he was under investigation for Russian influence. He invited the Russians into Lavrov, the foreign minister, and uh, you, the ambassador of the U.S. <laughs> into the Oval Office to complain about Comey, the shamelessness of it, the selfishness. I saw this pursuit of his selfish, personal, political agenda, not the public interest. In the impeachment that I worked on, what was his Ukraine extortion when he tells the president of Ukraine, uh, who, who says, I need help, I want to buy javelins, that we know why, he says, I'd like you to do us a favor, though. He wants dirt on Biden. He doesn't even want an investigation, tells the guy he wants an announcement. 
so that uh, perverting power to serve himself, all of this is uh, driving the division. Look at the damage that he did. Charlottesville, there are good people on both sides. Not only a lie, but fanning the flames uh, that uh, directly have, have created a climate where um, the incitement uh, of uh, white replacement theory and this terrible Buffalo tragedy is possible. <laughs> all culminating last, uh, uh, but the, containing all the sins, the attack on the democracy, the open attempted coup jo next door to Joyce in Georgia. We have the tape just find 11,780 votes, one more than necessary, he demanded of the Georgia Secretary of State, even if he believed he was defrauded, and he didn't, there's a lot of proof he knew better. Even if he believed it, he can't take the law into his own hands and fight a fraud with a fraud. Any more than if your friends are the victim of violence, you can go do vigilante violence. That was vigilante fraud. And that is an assault on democracy. It was an attempted coup. Most tragically, it hasn't ended. The big lie campaign is still going. The effort to change the rules and change the referees is burned so that next time they can change the results is going from coast to coast. And that's why we have four big solutions, four boxes that offer the solution to trumpery that we lay out in the book. Well, let's go there. I, I mean, I would love to drill down on the sins and the, the institutions that they impacted. But I think at this point, um, as we're reliving some of the worst excesses of the Trump administration, we should talk about solutions because this is the pressing problem in front of us. This is the work that all of us in this room, this is why we're here, I suspect, along with many of our fellow citizens, we're trying to figure out what can we do, what role can we play? So let's talk first about that landscape writ large, Norm, what needs to happen? Well, um, there are four boxes <laughs> that the American people and our representatives can fill to hold trumpery accountable. Um, and some, when, when some avenues are closed off, we need to find others. The first is the uh, roll call box in Congress. I saw them up close. I sat 10 <laughs> feet from the clerk when I was doing impeachment. There's, it would have been great if Congress had passed comprehensive election and democracy forms. They were needed. The For the People Act, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights uh, Act, uh, the um, um, uh, and their successors in the Senate. Um, uh, those had solutions for all of the seven deadly sins of trumpery, but there's still hope. I see Fred Wertheimer is on with us, my mentor. I think my fifth grade teacher who was my first mentor in government reform, she helped me interpret. Richard Nixon is also on with us. Uh, Fred has mentored me as a watchdog. And we wrote for the Washington Post that um, that a, if the, uh, there's a reforms to the Electoral Count Act that can still be accompanied by bipartisan plus factors, we call it ECA plus. And if there's very robust funding solutions, if we um, uh, have federal laws that deal with these assaults and threats against election workers and on and on, you still could get solutions. State legislatures and state regulators like AGs can still do a tremendous amount uh, to, uh, to find a solution. So that's the legislative tally sheet. Check the boxes there. We hope to get those votes. Even if that doesn't work, number two, 2020, as I said, a great national referendum at the ballot box. And uh, 2020 was one at the ballot box. 22 can be one as well. We need to speak out. That's why I wrote this book. We need to make clear that trumpery is on the ballot. It's not a partisan issue. Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger did more today to illuminate the corruption of their own party by calling them out than um, party opponents ever could do. Number three, 
And 2024 will also be an important referendum. Number three, and this will bring the ballot box to life, I think, the cable box. That is the January 6th committee hearings. They are going to explain. People know what happened on January 6th. There's still some question about those 187 mysterious minutes of Trump's inaction when he was privately rooting on the uh, insurrectionists. But the key thing for the January 6th committee in describing the attempted coup is the lead up to January 6th. They need to educate America. And then the aftermath of January 6th, this ongoing campaign that I work on, I'm privileged to work on with our wonderful team at States United Democracy Center, Summer On, my co-chair, Christy Todd Whitman, our dynamic CEO, Joanna Lidgate, and now almost 40 incredibly talented people um, uh, dealing with this ongoing crisis of our democracy. They want to change the rules and change the referees because the rules and the referees, election officials, got in their way in 2020 so they can do what they couldn't do in 2020, change the results. And so many of people are fighting um, to deal with that. And the January 6th committee needs to explain how that's driven by the big lie and ongoing crisis. That's the cable box. The fourth and final box is the jury box. I think it is going to be very important that those who committed crimes, and we now have, don't take my word for it, we have a federal judge in California, Judge David Carter, very distinguished district court judge, says Trump and his co-conspirators likely committed crimes. Those were judicial findings. And the January 6th committee hearings are going to take that question of criminality and we're gonna learn day after day. We're gonna look at the evidence. I think that's gonna culminate. I believe we're gonna see this year, next year, prosecutions, at least in Georgia. So that's the jury box. Those are the four boxes that offer hope in a time of resurgent trumpery, Joyce. I suspect, Norm, that accountability matters a lot to you. It does to me. I'm a mom and a prosecutor, a former prosecutor, and so accountability hits pretty squarely um, in, in both of those sort of uh, uh, parts of life. Do you think that a prosecution in Georgia, and I know I'm just hitting you out of the blue with this, but I think it's an important conversation. We've never have. discussed it. We, we have not. Do you <laughs> think um, that Georgia alone is enough? If Merrick Garland does nothing, would you feel like Georgia alone could bring accountability? I wrote with the wonderful uh, Dennis Aftergood, who's one of our most prolific op-ed authors. He writes- He's I, amazing, I, he, right? He's like Walter Winchell. He writes a daily column on accountability. Um, uh, I wrote with Dennis on the signs that are pointing. And Joyce, I know you and I agree on this. Our friend, Barb McQuaid, discusses it with us from time to time. The indications are point that are that DOJ is now um, moving from the uh, low level insurrection as dangerous, dangerous as they are, asking them about those who may have been involved further up the ladder in the White House, in the Oval Office, looking at the planning, looking at the funding. So the arrows are pointing. I've known Merrick Garland. I've had the honor of knowing him for three decades. He's the same person I met uh, when we, uh, shortly after we both arrived in Washington. Uh, and when he says he will follow the facts and the law where they lead, you know this too, Joyce, he will, okay? Now he'll make an independent judgment. I think DOJ does need to take a hard look. Um, and I'll be publishing an analysis at Brookings of um, these questions of criminality as a guide to help us all understand the facts and the law that the 1-6 committee will be looking at. Um, and we'll see what they say, what we learn. There'll be bombshells. But yes, I think even if Merrick Garland doesn't deem for any reason that there should be a prosecution, and we do need to let the 1-6 committee hearings play out, let's look at the evidence. Even if he doesn't, yes, I believe a Georgia prosecution makes the point. Georgia has some of the best law. I've written about it at Brookings at length. It fits like a glove, the conduct of Trump on that tape. Um, solicitation of election fraud, uh, racketeer influence and corrupt organization 
law, RICO law. The Georgia law is very good. The prosecutor is very good. Bonnie Willis, she just charged rappers. She's charged teachers who were in a cheating scandal with RICO violations. And she has a lot more courage than Alvin Bragg uh, and a lot more wisdom uh, in how she's handling this. We can talk about the disappointment. There was proof beyond a reasonable doubt of Trump's financial crimes, crimes in New York. And she has great evidence that tape just find 11,780 votes. You, you people often talk about intent, Joyce. We know how tough that is. No matter what you believe, you can't take the law into your own hands. And that's what Trump is doing on that tape. That tape by itself, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So I think that's a great case that can deliver the goods. But I'm hopeful that there'll be federal prosecutions as well. The evidence certainly seems to point that way. Yeah, you know, just to drill down on that a little bit, I confess as a prosecutor, I'd be delighted to have that tape of Trump alternately cajoling and threatening Georgia's Secretary of State to find him exactly one more vote um, than Joe Biden got in Georgia, right? That evidence is pretty good. It's not all the way to intent, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence around it that I think is very helpful. But I'll tell you, Norm, I Although I am a huge fan of Bonnie Willis, she showed a lot of bravery in being willing to take down um, the Georgia Teachers Union in a cheating scandal. That might not sound comparable to going after a president, but in Georgia state politics, that was a pretty fearless move to pull, and, and her office is very well staffed. I'm nonetheless very concerned about the mechanics of prosecuting a former president in a state court in Georgia. She lacks, for instance, extraterritorial subpoena power. It seems a little bit, like, you know, unfair to ask the Fulton <clears throat> County District Attorney to shoulder the burden of America's future. We're lucky that she's there. By the same token, um, like you, I have great confidence that when Merrick Garland says, as he did on January 5th, that he will follow the facts wherever they go, that he is dead serious. You and I both know that prosecutors often investigate cases where they believe a, a target is guilty, but for technical reasons, they can't prosecute the case. Maybe they don't have enough evidence. They believe the defendant is guilty. They're not sure it's sufficient proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You know, Bob Mueller had that problem with Trump, and he pointed out early on in his report that folks in Trump's orbit deliberately kept evidence away from him. They destroyed it. They hid it. They uh, put it offshore. And, and Mueller makes the comment early on in the report that had evidence been available to him, he might have looked at certain events differently. So there's always that risk of obstruction. But there's also something that you talk about in the book, and this is, uh, I think, a really good point to make that it's not just Trump who broke our institutions, that we do have a certain historical trajectory that made it easier for him. And you talk about something near and dear to my heart, DOJ's decision not to prosecute Bush-era officials who were involved in writing the torture memo. There's a subtle point that I think people should contemplate here. On the one hand, we do not want to be the banana republic that routinely prosecutes our former leaders. We all get that that's dangerous. Those big crowds chanting, lock her up, uh, that's not American. By the same token, some events are uniquely different. Some people would argue that torture rings that bell. Many people would argue that fomenting a coup rings that bell. So you're the ethicist here. How do we draw these fine lines between becoming a banana republic and being a country that insists upon accountability when it's appropriate? Well, um, that is that is why you and I um, have um, you know have both emphasized the importance of doing the kind of analysis, including the analysis that we do in overcoming trumpery that you and I do on the air. You uh, you approach uh, things as a former prosecutor. I approach them as I was a defense lawyer for a quarter of a century. We look uh, sometimes differently at, um, at the approach, but we agree on the importance of upholding the rule of law. I think on the part of, you know, the answer to your question is that if, the case is substantiated and well substantiated, whether in Georgia state 
or in uh, a prosecution by DOJ on the federal side by the facts and the law. And in this report, I'm going to release at Brookings, I have a long analysis also of the defenses because we have to contend with the claims that Trump is going to make. Uh, same with my Georgia report, dozens of pages going through each and every defense that we could think of. Um, you know, nobody, um, uh, e an even more important principle, I think it is the most important principle of our rule of law system is no one is above the law. And so we would be slipping into um, banana republic territory if Trump committed crimes, clearly, if there's powerful evidence that anyone else would go to jail for. And I fault Bob. He's my friend. I've worked with him for years. Um, you know, I sat 10 feet from him also during the impeachment when he testified to the House Judiciary Committee. And I fault him for not. He was too generous, too cautious. And he did not really do, that was the topic of my previous book, um, A Case for the American People. He did not do uh, justice in his caution to the wrongdoing. You can see if you read his report, there is compelling evidence of obstruction. Anyone else would go to jail for that. Merrick Garland shouldn't, and I think won't make the same mistake. But to come back to Fonnie Willis, because I think we, I think we agree that if Merrick Garland doesn't do it, it may not be fair to put the burden on her shoulders, Joyce. But American history is the story. We have a chapter in the book on the international situation. And I often talk about um, Trump's treatment of Ukraine as setting the template. He treated him as a football. So Putin now is just doing the same thing in a different way. Um, you know, look at what an unlikely world hero George W. Bush just said he's the new Winston Churchill Zelensky is. Fonnie Willis will just be the latest in a long line of American heroes who have, against all odds, starting with the founders and framers of our country, redeemed our democracy. I believe in her. I believe in her case. I think she will do the right thing. And just from a technical perspective, Joyce, the beauty of the Georgia case is it will be streamlined, but the RICO charges will give it heft, including sentencing heft. She has the capacity to do this. If she can take on the Atlanta teachers, she can take on Donald Trump, and she's doing it in a careful way. She hasn't had a single slip. She's taken the time to build her case. I think it, it will be, if she brings it, it'll be a powerful case. So I have confidence in her and her case. Well, from your mouth to God's ear, Norm, um, I think that I can ask you one more question before I get the hook so our, our um, listeners can ask questions. Here's my last question. What do we do, each of us sitting here, people out in the country who are watching this, who are afraid that the January 6th committee won't reach people who need to be reached, who are afraid that these prosecutions won't come to pass? What do we do? What's the role that we can play in moving this forward and restoring our country? Um, each and every one of you has a critical role to play. And if I may, since I am of all the families I identified, uh, going back to grade school who are represented on here, uh, the people I love from so many different parts of my life who are at our Big Ten book party, I also consider myself a part of the Big Ten family. And Sue started off by saying there's going to be letter writing for, uh, what state is it for, Sue, Michigan? Michigan. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, you know, every American, that is the beauty and the resilience of American democracy. It's not Putin's Russia. We have a two and a half century tradition of vibrant democracy. It's a democracy that thanks to everybody in the Big Ten. And I know how hard both the regulars, hey, Wendy, your brother's here. Admit him to the waiting room. Um, both the regulars on the Big Tent, who I've talked to so many times before, and, and my beloved friends who are joining from every walk of life. Hi, John, uh, who, uh, who, are, um, who are in the Big Tent for the first time. You saved us in 2020. 
it was not uh, a um, it was not a redemption from on high. Everyone had a role to play, and every person who voted, who got other people to vote, who spoke out for the sake of ro- voting, who made contributions, large or small, to our democracy, the bipartisan support that we got, that led to the triumph of that 2020 referendum on democracy. And then the people of both parties, when it came time to count the vote, to certify the vote, those 63 cases I worked with, there's people on this call who are very involved in winning those 63 cases that Trump brought. So many so-called Trump judges, including at the Supreme Court, who so devastated us with the trumpery of the Alito draft, devastating. They came through in 2020 on the democracy issues. Maybe they didn't want Trumpery. Uh, They wanted to perfect Trumpery. Whatever the explanation is, it worked in 2020. We can talk about abortion. I hope people will rise up in 2022 because it will also be a referendum on the Supreme Court's corruption and their attack on the rights of women and on the rule of law. And I wrote an op-ed What Alito wrote exemplifies all seven deadly sins of trumpery. And then there's so much you can do to support each of those things we talked about. The 1-6 hearing, get the message out. The 2022 midterms, let's repeat our success. Let's get ready for 24. Um, Spread the word about Fonnie Willis. Encourage DOJ when the evidence is in from the hearings to do the right thing. Um, And uh, in every one of these, and encourage your It's not too late for Congress to do the right thing or state and local legislative bodies and regulators. Encourage them. I was texting with your wonderful guest from last time, Jocelyn Benson, who was on for the first 30 minutes and wanted to ask the first question. She says hi to everyone. Look at Jocelyn. She's such, I'm not saying this in a partisan way, but she's such a hero. All of us of both parties and we big tent represents every party. We need to support the Jocelyn's in their official capacity. There is so much to do and we outline it in overcoming Trumpery, the ecosystem of wonderful organizations we support on the C3C4 side or on the hard side, the political side. Look at Liz Cheney. She did more than anybody. She is the hero of the day for calling out the Trumpery, the embrace, the silence in the face of white supremacy of her colleagues, uniform silence uh, about the white supremacy of the Buffalo attack. Let, you know, she is the hero of the day for calling that out. And make no mistake, that was a knife thrust in the heart of Trumpery. And the book is full of many, many other things. So by being here together, by doing those things together, there's so much we can do to defeat this, uh, the seven deadly sins of Trumpery. Norm, I think that's just the right place to end, because obviously it was the voters in 2020 who delivered a healthy dose of accountability to Trump at the polls. That's hopefully what we will do again. Um, Wendy, on on that note, my thanks to Norm for patiently answering my questions. Now you'll have to face Wendy and our audience. Thank you both so much. That was great. Well, we have a lot of questions, but the first one I want to ask, if I believe Secretary Benson had to step off. But the the first question I wanted to ask is if you can give us a sense of what the hearings will be like. Just a a play by play. Yes, we'll give you the advance. We'll give you the advance uh, of what we'll be saying on our respective cable networks. (laughs) Of course, having uh, having, uh, just worked up there, I'll I'll offer a word. Joyce and I trade these ideas too. We kibitz with many of you who are on on uh, the Zoom today. Um, you know, I, there, there will be eight hearings uh, spread across uh, June. Um, the hearings will uh, have been described as uh, blockbusters. And I think that there will be many new revelations. I believe the hearings will s- explain that January 6th was not an isolated event. It had a long run up and it has a long ongoing effect. And indeed, in some senses, as I said earlier, the insurrection has not ended. The big lie continues. They're getting ready for the next attempted coup. All of that will be, uh, that's new for the American people. There'll be new facts, but the narrative, the storytelling, 
that Joyce and I try to do on TV, but also as trial lawyers, when we talk to a jury, they're going to tell a story to the American people, be a mix of prime time and otherwise. And uh, I think it, they are going to, and then they'll be followed by an interim report. We don't know yet what'll be in it, but drawing some conclusions about what they just said. And that will likely come at some other point over this summer. Joyce? The big challenge the January 6th committee is going to face is simply going to be getting the attention of Americans who are really worried about the fact that they're paying $4.62 a gallon for gas or whatever it is where you live. Big issue. You know, I am cautiously optimistic that this team is up to the challenge. I'm obviously a fan of people who have experience in a courtroom at telling stories, and the committee hired some really exceptional staff. This is maybe a little bit inside of baseball, but they've hired two U.S. attorneys, former U.S. attorneys, a Republican and a Democrat, my um, former colleague, Tim Hafey, who is the United States attorney in Charlottesville, who wrote the postmortem on that terrible, tragic rally in Charlottesville and did an excellent job of explaining things in plain English in bite-sized pieces that were readily absorbable by folks who frankly have a lot of stuff going on in their lives. I think that bodes well for the trajectory of these hearings. But like you say, Norm, making this real for people, understanding that this didn't start or stop on January 6th is the key. And of course, Congress has a, a role here. They have a role that they statutorily need to play. And, and part of that role is thinking about legal fixes, laws that need to be passed to prevent this from happening again. I think we'll hear them focus a lot on those sorts of issues. And that will make the future of this slow rolling coup in progress. Uh, I think that's gonna pop that into focus for folks. So I have a question prompted by um, today's events with the Cruz decision where the Supreme Court handed down uh, what strikes me as a pretty devastating decision um, that uh, uh, John Cooper raised a question. I'm sorry, not someone else. Sorry about that. Um, James Reeser raised a question about the, the enormous blow to controlling campaign financing and also to regulating free speech, because it seems someone else had asked about um, can't, can't Congress legislate away Citizens United? I'm not sure they can after Cruz. I think that decision may knock that away. And I, I would love to hear from both of you on that, Joyce. You take the first one this time, Joyce. I worry a lot about Citizens United and the impact of money and especially dark money on our um, democracy, I guess our constitutional republic, if you want to be more precise. So this opinion this morning, for those of you who haven't seen it, Ted Cruz, um, everybody's favorite senator from Texas, decided that he ought to be able to raise money uh, after an election to pay off his debt, to pay off money that he had personally loaned to the campaign, I think, in this case not a large sum of money, but he proposed that a Texas law that restricted his ability to do that violated his First Amendment rights. And surprise, the Supreme Court agreed with him. People are still parsing through all the implications of this decision. One possibility is that it goes a long way towards removing restrictions on individual contributions to campaigns. We're gonna have to see how all of that comes out in the wash. Uh, but it's not a good sign about where this court is headed. If we want to see Citizens United come to an end, it's going to need to happen in a very tightly put together piece of legislation that will be very difficult to challenge in the courts. And as we know, this court has a, really a separate jurisprudence for political issues that benefit Republicans. I wish I wasn't saying that to you, but increasingly, I'm distressed by steps that this new conservative majority is willing to take. Two things. Um, the um, the thing that the Citizens United decision allowed Congress to do, I worked on it when I was in the Obama White House, uh, is uh, pass radical transparency laws, the Disclose Act. That was in the comprehensive package that Congress didn't move. It's not going to be in this if there is one Electoral Count Act Plus, unfortunately, but that remains an option. Beyond that, 
my view is that there are other clever things Congress can do, uh, even though Citizens United set some guardrails, those guardrails have been expanded by the Cruz decision this morning. Uh, he's only our, uh, uh, so um, there, that issue is treated extensively in the book, in the chapter by one of our great campaign finance gurus, Professor Richard Painter. It's also familiar to you. Have we had him in the big tent? We should invite him sometime. Y'all would love Richard. Um, so he goes through what is and is not permissible. And that makes a very important point that goes to the previous question about the book. The book documents the terrible acts and extracts this framework of Trump's philosophy from them for posterity before they're lost. We needed to capture all those facts. It is a comprehensive record also of all the solutions we need. So even like we talk about filibuster reform, we didn't get it, but we came close. We moved the bar. I think the next time there's a pro-democracy majority in charge of the Senate, you're going to see filibuster reform. That's a new standard. So we list all that stuff in the book. We preserve it. In addition to the open results, the four boxes that are still available to us, and the book is full of solutions that the... 1-6 committee can also look at when they write their report. Don't say all hope is lost because actually a couple things we recommend in chapter, uh, in the chapter on POTA, uh, the uh, Protecting Our Democracy Act, um, which is chapter, uh, chapter eight, Congressional Oversight Authority actually passed and we're signed into law bipartisan limitations on the president running rampant over the power of the purse that is held by Congress. Uh, and it was uh, bipartisan. So we can keep chipping away like I hope to uh, I hope we'll continue to do at the federal and state level. So we have a couple of questions relating to messaging, and they also tie back to what Joyce was saying, that it will be a challenge for the hearings is breaking through the concerns people have about paying for gas and, uh, and abortion and everything else. So um, do you have any thoughts on how uh, the pro-democracy party could clarify their messages and get them out and what should be done with the, you know, whatever hearing report is put out in terms of, of blasting the messaging so it, it actually gets through to the entire country? Well, uh, they are um, expert messengers, messengers on the committee. I, it's many of the people and they've, they've rehired and brought in additional ones. We were effective. Uh, I thought um, if you looked at the polls during the impeachment and the trial, gradually we got those numbers. Like, for example, by the end of the trial, we had almost 70 percent of Americans who agreed that uh, witnesses should be called, which was one of our big messages, including John Bolton. That included a lot of Trump voters and Trump supporters. So they've learned all those lessons. They've brought back some of the best communicators. The members on here, I've worked closely with Adam Schiff. In fact, they, if you look on the back cover of the book, the first blurb is some kind words from Adam Schiff who read the manuscript. Uh, Jamie Raskin is another one who has been my client. They've got great messengers among the committee members, among the staff. They've got prime time, real estate, a bunch of it. And they've got a great story to tell with a lot of new details. So I'm hopeful. Joyce? So I'm going to go shallow here and say that Trump wrote great bumper stickers, you know, build the wall, right? Simple, effective, people embraced it. Democrats don't often do as well. I suspect that that's because the concepts that matter to us are complicated and they're nuanced, and they don't always lend themselves to bumper stickers. But recently, we hit a home run down in Florida when we characterized DeSantis's horrific bill as don't say gay. That was great packaging, great marketing, and it caught on fire. I hope that we're going to do that with the January 6th committee. I hope that deliberately for each of the days of hearings, 
there will be a theme and there will be a bumper sticker and it will be something that people and look i say this advisedly as someone who's in alabama people down here aren't talking about the january 6th mm. committee in every conversation that they have like people are when i'm in washington and new york it's a big country just like it's a big tent so we have to find ways to meet people where they live to bring people into the conversation in a way that works with their life. I, so I don't mean that as a flippant suggestion that we need to write better bumper stickers. I think really we do. So uh, we have a couple of questions about accountability, which is the big, the big question. What's going on? Why is it taking so long? Why aren't we seeing any of the big cheeses being held accountable? And 45 days is the average sentence for these guys in the January 6th hearing it, that I'm a bloodthirsty person as my brother can attest, but that just makes me insane. I thought that stuff was like really not, you, I thought you weren't supposed to do that, breaking into the Senate and whatnot. Two part question. The first is for John Rogovin to attest if his sister is bloodthirsty or not. And I the second- ones. <laughs> I like people who are bloodthirsty. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, this is not, I, <clears throat> all kidding aside, Joyce, I'll say a word about accountability, then pass to you. It's something Joyce and I talk about, and many of you on this call, talk. we talk about all the time and work on. Um, the, um, no one, Trump has been dodging accountability. If I had to name a single thing, genius, about evil genius about Donald Trump. His single greatest skill is in dodging accountability. He is the true Teflon Don, Teflon Trump. And um, uh, it's extraordinary when you look at how, starting at the beginning of his career, a half century ago with the alleged racial discrimination in the properties he managed with his father, how he has managed over and over again to skate, to tiptoe on that line without toppling over. I thought for sure, I did not go to work on impeachment uh, to, you know, to, 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 to have that collapse. I looked at the evidence, just like I looked at the evidence of Alvin Bragg. If you don't believe me, I wrote long 100 page plus Brookings reports. Bumper stickers are not my forte. I will be the first to admit. Uh, uh, I, I, you would need a trailer tractor or a, a, uh, a freight train to, uh, to carry my bumper sticker. Um, I wrote long reports on how Mueller had him on obstruction of justice, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Same Alvin Bragg had him on financial crimes. He's like the Houdini of crime, but I don't think he's going to get away, nor those around him are going to get away from the series of hurdles that they have to run. The 1-6 committee has done a real investigation. We're gonna get that evidence in the public record. Fannie Willis is smart, tough. She's been preparing her whole career for this moment. She is dogged and determined. She's on his trail. Merrick Garland is coming behind. We have no finer legal mind in America, no more integrity. He won't flinch. He feels none of Bragg's fear. Uh, uh, of what I believe, the fear of fighting with Trump and maybe losing, he'll make a straight up call. So do I think Trump can escape that one, two, three punch? No, I do not. Okay, so unfortunately we have to bring this to a close pretty soon. And Sue Mandel had a great idea, which is to end with some one word answer questions. <laughs> will, will Trump be held accountable? Yes, I think absolutely. The voters have done it in the past. They'll do it again, if no one else. Norm? He will, yes. I did okay. three words by accident. That's okay. We're, you can give fewer as we go. <laughs> will the Republicans- I'm sorry, I'm a Jewish woman. I can't do one word. Can't we I have- a... By one word, we don't really mean one. <laughs> you know, it's one and you go back for seconds. So will tr the Republicans win the House in the fall? No. Sue will kill me if I answer that yes, because she is constantly telling me to, it's not over till it's over. Too soon to tell. 
American women are going to march straight into the polling places in November and insist that they have the right to be full participants in society. You know, I, I know that this defies midterm wisdom, but I think we're going to see something unusual happen in 2022. Okay. And Strong we'll headwinds. Strong headwinds. We got to be honest. But too soon. I hear to that. Tell. What about the Senate? Will the Republicans win the Senate in the fall? That's a closer one. I, I mean, again, it depends on how good Democrats are at messaging. There's a path. It's a narrow one. It's a limited one. I don't think we should bargain against ourselves. I think that we should run straight through the ticker tape and try to, to you know, go for the big house as well as the little house. I'll do another TT acronym, the Trumpery ticket. It depends on the Trumpery ticket. If the Herschel Walkers and the Dr. Oz's and the Doug Mastrianos are the nominees, Pence, I don't believe Pennsylvania will take a Doug Mastriano or a Dr. Oz in the general election. And even Herschel Walker is the most favorable opponent uh, that uh, the wonderful Senator Reverend Warnock, Raphael Warnock, who spoke at the other book, the book launch, it wasn't a book party at Brookings, uh, the best opponent he could hope for. So it depends on the trumpery ticket if they get through the primaries. Okay, this is by definition gets two words. Who will be the 2024 tickets? I'll do Joyce, you do the you do the Democrat, I'll do the Republican. Okay. Are you giving me the hard one? You go ahead and go first, so I have a minute to think. Trump. Oh, and you want to know who's second on the yeah, ticket Trump, with him? Trump and Trump. Oh, oh, I have not been. Mike Pence. <laughs> Trump, uh, Trump DeSantis. Okay, um, <laughs> Joyce, we can come back to it. Will Trumpery I, go away? If you want to, <laughs> and for the Democrats, Biden Harris. I agree a hundred percent. I don't think that there is any reason to change a team that's strong. Okay, will Trumpery go away? Um, yes or no? You know, Trumpery is a feature of the landscape. It was here before Trump, it'll be here after him. The question is, what are we going to do to expose it and minimize it? I think more so than will it go away. I can uh, finally give a one word answer that captures all that nuance. Agree. <laughs> okay. So I have one last one, which makes me a little sad, but because uh, it means we're closing. But will you two come back to Big Tent? You have to yes. yes. Our answer. Good. Joyce, and I think we should bring Barb with us next time. She absolutely. would love the Big Ten, and they would love her. For those of y'all who don't know my colleague Barb McQuaid, who is the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of Michigan, and is my podcast co-host, she would have been a great addition to this conversation. We should definitely do that. The two of them are like my big sisters. They beat the crap out of me on a regular basis, intellectually. How <laughs> to hang you. <laughs> Intellectual. Thank you both so much. This was amazing. And we will take you up on your offer to bring Barb and, <laughs> and come back soon, maybe after the hearing, so we can get a wrap up. Um, so for those of you who are new to Big Tent, I urge you to take a look at the website and you can learn more about us and to participate in our um, various activities and hope you join us again soon. Thanks very much. Have a good night, everyone.